Well, good morning. April is fast receding, 24th already. John speaks to us. After Jesus had fed the 5,000 men, the disciples saw him walking on the sea. The next day, the crowd that remained across the sea saw that there had been only one boat there. Jesus had not gone along with his disciples in the boat, but only his disciples had left. Other boats came from Tiberias, near the place where they had eaten the bread, when the Lord gave thanks. When the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they themselves got into boats and came to Capernaum looking for Jesus. When they found him across the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered them, and he said, Amen, amen, I say to you, you are looking for me not because you saw signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. Do not work for food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. From, uh, for on him f the Father God has set his seal. So they said to him, What can we do to accomplish the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God that you believe in the one he sent. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. See, here's where Jesus lets them know. You know, the importance, as I said last week, of hospitality, but it leads into um, an increase in faith life and a discussion of what really matters, that you believe in the one he sent. Jesus kind of confronts them in a, uh, uh, an interesting way. He said, yeah, are you looking for me because you got a free meal? Are you looking for me because you really want to hear more about the reason why I am here, that you believe in me? I am the one who he sent. That's a quote right from the end of the gospel. You know, are you, why are you here? Because, uh, you know, you had a good time on the side of the hill and you, you, you know, you got a free lunch. Uh, that's not the reason why things happen in terms of what I'm doing. That was just because of compassion and the need to do that because it is important. But the matter of my presence in your midst is about the love of God in the world because of who I am and that you will believe. And don't forget, this is the same crowd that I'm sure had seen him do all sorts of other things. They knew that he was much more than a purveyor of, of loaves of bread and fish. They knew that there were other things going on in the way that Jesus was a healer and a preacher. But uh, Jesus wanted to cement that in place. Uh, I am the one who he sent. You do know that that's really what this is all about. Uh, whether they believed or thought that, I'm sure some of them did. And remember the Gospels? We only have the barest snippets of the whole travels and life and times of Christ. The rest is kind of left up to us. We are the current uh, people uh, alive and well now believing in this, and it's up to us to put it into practice. I think sometimes that we are among those who ate on the side of the hill that day, um, are we in our faith simply because of rather superfluous things, because we believe that God will do good things for us if we're nice people and come to church? Or hopefully is it the much deeper kind of faith that speaks to us about um, our journey in life in, in Christ? It's up to us to make the decision, but I would, if I were you with this gospel, kind of place ourselves in it. You know, we're standing there and Jesus is saying, uh, was it because of the loaves and the fish or because you truly believe that I come from God and have the message of eternal life for you? We have to each answer that question ourselves. Take care, my friends. I will see you tomorrow. Tuesday comes quick enough. God bless. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God as Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. And good morning. good morning. On this gray morning, and we welcome all those who are watching far and near, and we are very grateful that you are part of our parish this morning. With that in mind, we place ourselves in the loving presence of our God. 
Father in heaven, may we be like Peter in the letter today, that we go out and engage our brothers and sisters and draw them near to their faith. Lord, have mercy. May we do it with convincing witness to our discipleship. Christ, have mercy. May each day be an opportunity for a witness to justice and peace in our world, so much needed these days. Lord, have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to people of goodwill. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you. We give you thanks for your great glory, Lord God, heavenly King, O oh God, Almighty Father, Lord Jesus Christ, only begotten Son, Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, you take away sins of the world have mercy on us you take away the sins of the world receive our prayer you are seated at the right hand of the father have mercy have mercy on us Let us pray. May your people exalt forever, O God, in renewed youthfulness of spirit, so that rejoicing now in the restored glory of our adoption, we may look forward in confident hope to the rejoicing of the day of resurrection through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and proclaimed, You who are Jews, indeed all of you staying in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and listen to my words. You who are Israelites, hear these words. Jesus the Nazarene was a man commended to you by God with mighty deeds, wonders, and signs, which God worked through him in your midst, as yourselves know. This man, delivered up by the set plan and foreknowledge of God, you killed, using lawless men to crucify him. But God raised him up, releasing him from the throes of death, because it was impossible for him to be held by it, for David says of him, I saw the Lord ever before me. With him at my right hand, I shall not be disturbed. Therefore, my heart has been glad and my tongue exalted. My flesh, too, will dwell in hope because you will not abandon my soul <clears throat> to the netherworld, nor will you suffer your Holy One to see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with your joy in your presence. My brothers, one can confidently say to you about the patriarch David that he died and was buried, and his tomb is in our mists to this day. 
But since he was a prophet and knew God had sworn an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants upon his throne, he foresaw and spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that neither was he abandoned to the netherworld, nor did he see his flesh see corruption. God raised this Jesus. All of this we are witnesses, exalted at the right hand of God. He perceived the promise of the Holy Spirit from the Father and poured him forth as you see and hear the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from the first letter of St. Peter. Beloved, if you invoke as Father him who judges impartially according to each one's works, conduct yourself with reverence during the time of your sojourning, realizing that you were ransomed from your futile contact, conduct handed on by your ancestors not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a spotless, unblemished lamb. He was known before the foundation of the world, but revealed in the final time for you, who through him believe in Christ, in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. The word of the Lord.
be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. That very day, the first day of the week, two of Jesus' disciples were going to a village seven miles from Jerusalem called Emmaus. They were things that had occurred. And it happened that while they were conversing and debating, Jesus himself drew near, walked with them, but their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing as you walk along? They stopped looking very sad and downcast. One of them, Cleophas, said to him in reply, are you the only visitor who has not been to Jerusalem and does not know of these things, the things that have taken place in these days? He replied to them, what sort of things? They said to him, the things that happened to Jesus the Nazarene was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. How our chief priests and rulers both handed him over to a sentence of death and then crucified him. We were hoping he would be the one to redeem Israel. And beside all this, it is now the third day since this has taken place. Some women from our group, however, have astounded us. They were at the tomb early in the morning. They did not find his body, but they came back and reported they had seen a vision of angels who announced that he was alive. Then some of us went to the tomb. We found things just as the women had described, but him they did not see. He said to them, oh, how foolish you are, how slow of heart to believe all the prophets had spoken. Was it not necessary that Christ should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them what referred to him in all the scriptures. As they approached the village to which they were going, he gave the impression he was going on further. But they urged him, stay with us. It is nearly evening and the day is over. So he went in to stay with them. It happened that while he was with them at table, he took bread, he said the blessing, broke it, and he gave it to them. With that, their eyes were opened, they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he spoke to us on the way, opening the scriptures to us? They set out at once. They returned to Jerusalem, where they found gathered together the eleven, and those who were with him, saying the following, the Lord has been raised, truly has appeared to Simon. Then two of them recounted what had taken place on the way, how he was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. This, my friends, is the gospel of the Lord. In a little while, I'm going to ask you to do something that uh, congregations hate when the pastor asks them to do, but you'll get over it. Don't worry about it. There, twice there's a little phrase mentioned here that's really important. It says, he spoke to us on the way, and then they recounted what had taken place on the way. Early Christians, as I've said many times, didn't have the name Christian until many decades, if not a couple hundred years had passed. They were called followers of the way. There was no organized church you know, Vatican, no, uh, you know, churches like church, church. They kind of met in basements and in synagogues and anywhere they could. Their, their faith was very much personal, a personal relationship with Jesus. And they emulated who and what he was. And it was sometimes viewed with suspicion. They were persecuted depending on who the emperor happened to be at the moment. But they persisted in following this man on the way. They were followers of the way. So that meant that they were charitable. They were compassionate. They were peacemakers. They were lovers. They were kind. They took care of their own. As it said last week, they held everything in common. They shared their goods with others. They took care of the widows, the hungry, the starving, and the leper. They made sure if there were needs in the community that these needs were met. We continue to do that today. There's a straight line and an arrow that goes right from what Margaret said about a blood drive to what these people did back then. We continue to try to take care of the needs of our community because you and I are followers of the way. But this is very personal, this gospel. 
This is very personal because these people are following the way right from the horse's mouth. They are following the way from the Lord who has spoken to them and journeyed with them. So what better way to make this real than the following? I want you in a moment to close your eyes for one minute and I want you to imagine that like Joseph in a dream, the angel Gabriel has come to you and said, sometime when you're alone somewhere, Jesus is going to come to you and take a walk with you. And you can ask and say anything you want. What might it be? Perhaps in the verbiage of Mr. Spock on Star Trek, my thoughts to your thoughts, your thoughts to my thoughts. But nonetheless, where would that place be? Is it LBI? Is it um, Seaside? Maybe it's um, a walk in the uh, forest at Way Way On to State Park up in Sussex. Maybe it's just on your deck. Maybe it's in a quiet place anywhere you would like. But within the next 10 seconds, I'll tell you to go and then I will give you exactly one minute to have that conversation and ask whatever you want and um, or maybe grow angry and ask why the Lord you feel abandoned you. Whatever the case may be, I want you to close your eyes and do it now. up. One minute seems long, doesn't it? But in that time, your personal relationship with Christ became focused, didn't it? Because if all your faith is, or my faith is, coming here on Sunday morning, that certainly isn't enough. We walk every day with the Lord, and hopefully we have a conversation with the Lord every day, a conversation that challenges us, a conversation that gives us comfort, a conversation that might answer some questions and yet might leave some things as a mystery. But nonetheless, it is a walk with the Lord that we do every single day. And, and that's really very important because a relationship needs to be personal. You know, I've said many times that the one little uh, kind of, um, I don't know what you'd call it, but it was uh, like, kind of pop art, pop culture, were those bracelets that everybody wore a few years ago, what would Jesus do? You know, WWJD. I'm sorry that that was a fad that came and went because I thought it was the best thing in the whole world because every day you get to look at that and you get to think to yourself, what would Jesus do? But we may not have the bracelet, but we should still ask ourselves that question, especially in a challenging situation, when we're impatient, when we're angry, when we don't know where to turn, when we wonder where the answer will, will be and, and what that answer will challenge us to have to do. And that's really, really important because so many people kind of go off the deep end when they, when they hit those moments in life. I know they've said in my office many times. Um, I, when people are younger, it, it's, they seem more prone to it. I had the best office in the whole world when I was teaching high school. It was right on the corner, and it wasn't very big, but I fixed it up in a way that there was a little tiny sitting area and a chair, and there was a, a parade all day long of kids who would just come in and sit down. The lockers were right across from me, and I loved it. I absolutely, one of the best times of my life. But there were always those moments where I could tell when someone would come in and they would be looking very sad, and I'd say, okay, what happened? 
well, this and this happened because I did this and this. I said, well, listen, that was dopey. Why did you do that? Well, Father, because that's what people when they're 16 do sometimes. I said, well, then the, the best way to do that is not do it anymore, right? Yeah, I know you're right. Again, you face those challenges when you're young, and it's a learning curve, but they don't stop when you get to be 21 or 31. They continue. So walking with the Lord is so very, very important because we can get lost in things that are simply not important. And I want to draw your attention, this wonderful first letter from St. Peter for, to one line, realizing you were ransomed from your feudal conduct. One of the things that I've thought about since, since my mother passed and I turned 70 is how much more you kind of, and I, I suppose this happens through life as we grow, the, the most important thing to do is you kind of want to let things go after a while. You don't get hung up on stuff like you did when you were younger. So important just to let it go. And that the, the anger and the impatience and, and all the other stuff, you kind of look back on, on your life and you think, you know, there was a whole lot of stuff that I really got twisted up in knots about. And why? Why did I do that? Maybe because when you're young, you think you have time to get twisted up in knots. And as you grow older, you realize my time's precious. I don't want to waste it being angry, being impatient, having to, to deal with all those things, those recriminations. I want to move beyond all of that. And that's what Peter is talking about here. Beloved, if you invoke as Father him who judges impartially, conduct yourselves with reverence during the time of your sojourning. We are sojourning here on earth. Sojourning. We're on our way to you know where. We are sojourning. Isn't that a beautiful way to put it? I love the language. According to each one's own, conduct yourselves with reverence during the time of your sojourning. Conduct yourselves with reverence. Respect yourself. Respect yourself and respect others. That's what reverence means. It's one of those words that Catholics might not use or any religious person. They might think it's reserved to churchy things or, you know, scripture. Not at all. Conduct yourselves with reverence. Respect yourself. Respect others decency and, and kindness and all those other things. That is to revere the humanity in every single person. That's what reverence means. Conduct yourselves with reverence and let go of stuff, feudal, feudal conduct, right? Ransom from feudal conduct. We, we invest in so much. The old saying, not only can you not take it with you, your kids don't even want it. You know, people invest themselves in so much, and then you get to a point where, you know, um, would you like, no, Ma, I don't want that. You know, I have this beautiful thing, no, I don't want that either. And you realize all the accumulated, piled up stuff, where is that all going to go? It gets back to that other piece of scripture where, you know, the Lord gives that little parable um, about the man who has all his possessions in gold and silver. I will pull down my barns, well, let's say storage units, and um, I will build bigger ones. I will rent bigger ones and put it all in there. And then what's the message? You fool. This night your very life will be demanded of you, and to whom will all your piled up wealth go? So this is the dawn of Christianity. That's what the gospel and these letters are talking about. This is the very beginning of what lasted and of what we inherit today. And we are Peter. And I leave you with this because we are building our church. We are out in the world doing what Peter did and doing what others did. You are the disciples, as I've always said, in the vineyard of life, and so am I. I. We are out in there, and we're the ones that are encouraging others to reclaim their faith. Take every opportunity to be Peter, to be that person out there who reveres other people, who has reverence for other people, who understands the futility of clinging to things that are just not important, but clinging rather to faith, to walk with the Lord and then bring others into that wonderful relationship to walk with the Lord. Spring and summer are here. There'll be gatherings, picnics, barbecues. 
you'll have opportunities to talk about your church, to talk about your faith. Take those opportunities. So often I see grandparents bringing their grandchildren in to church. It's a beautiful thing. Maybe they couldn't bring in this, the kids, but they, they bring in the grandparents, the grandkids rather. It's a beautiful thing. There are so many little opportunities. I say the, the prayer at the Memorial Day Parade. They, I, I pray every year. They ask me to go and pray. I don't do it to stand there and make something of myself saying a prayer because it's usually very hot. But I go because it raises up our profile in the community. I do that for you, and I do, I do that for our parish. You have those opportunities. You are Peter out in the world. Imagine that this is a replica of the early church. We have so much work to do, my friends. And with reverence and respect, let us all be like Peter in the vineyard of life to walk with Christ and encourage others to walk with us as well. Please rise. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Our response will be hear us. For all present in, this, in the holy place and for all who recognize the Lord in one another, Lord, in your mercy, hear us. For all those who try to walk in the way of the Lord and for all who have strayed from the path, Lord, in your mercy, hear us. For those who generously share their time, talent, and treasure, Lord, in your mercy, hear us. For the homebound, for those in rehabilitation, and for those in hospice care, Lord, in your mercy, hear us. For all those who are in need of our prayers, and for all those who have asked us to pray for them, and for all whose names appear on the sick list in our parish bulletin, may God fill their lives with healing and peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear us. For all who have died to rise with Christ in eternal light, especially James Kindler and Anthony Rusamango, Magna, Rustico and Christina DeMuti, Timothy Coughlin, Father Dan Kelly, and Anton Legis Boroskos, for whom this ask is offered, Lord, in your mercy. There's a person here this morning who is about to undergo a significant um, healing treatment at the end of a long, long time of um, cancer treatments. And um, I'd like us to keep he and his family in our prayers and in our thoughts this morning for a successful transition back to good health. Lord, in your mercy. Yes. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee, and blessed art thou amongst women.